So guys, I'm here with Rory Van Vliet. Rory works for Corrections. He's got an extensive background in security work as well, bouncing tons of hands-on handling people. Yeah, bouncing at bars, bouncing at venues for concerts. I did protection services at a hospital, which I was dealing with uh, people in the psychiatric ward, the psychiatric wards, the emergency department, as well as dealing with the older individuals that are starting to deal with dementia. Yeah which is a very terrifying, awful thing to deal with and very hard to work with when we're looking at techniques that are safe to use. So one of the things we've talked about individually, but I thought we'd put on this video, is the problem with, you know, techniques that are commonly taught to law enforcement and security guards. And Same techniques like that. across the board for my security licensing with advanced security training for corrections. You see it for law enforcement, for police officers. You're seeing all these straight arm mark takedowns especially. This is one of the favorites because it ends up, you take your the offender or the inmate or whoever down onto their stomach. On paper like, it looks great. It looks you great. You me down, then yeah. you cuff me. You and drive them down and then yeah, from here I'm able to move immediately into like these positions where I'm going to be able to look at starting to secure the person in handcuffs or control them safely until backup is able to arrive. Sure. If I haven't killed them, face planting them into a concrete or yeah. into a curb, if it even works. If it even works. I've had, I've had maybe success with two times with this technique where I did it to uh, a lady I had to kick out of a bar in which I had this massive strength advantage. So I mean, <laughs> oh, we're so looking, you use this technique to beat up women and yeah, and old people. Okay. Or drunk people that are almost falling over themselves, in which we can't and really kind of guiding how we can't falling. look at that as any kind of evidence that this technique is going to be working. So, yeah. I'm not against the escort position. So what's the escort the position? The escort position is this position where I'm grabbing my opponent's wrist. I'm going to create some internal rotation of my opponent's shoulder by turning the thumb down and bringing it to my pocket. Usually is how it's described when it's being taught. I'm controlling here up at the shoulder. I like to do it like a Russian tie, basically like this. I think this is much more safe. Some people like to teach it here with the C grip blocking right here behind the elbow point. So we're going to be able to create a little more... Uh, leverage here with a fulcrum at the, the elbow, but I think it's weaker and it risks creating a little more space. Because this is ultimately the problem with a lot of stand-up techniques. When we're looking at submissions for joint locks, we need a lever, we need a fulcrum, and we need an anchor point. The problem with this is that there's never really an anchor point where I've immobilized the shoulder or immobilized the hip or really the elbow. That's where like a wrist lock, I have the anchor here, the fulcrum and the lever. So this could work. This is actually quite difficult for you to get out if I'm able to move immediately into the sure. pain compliance and cranking it. But if I'm trying to apply this and I start applying, your shoulder can move. Yeah. And so as you drop down and pull your elbow into your body, I've lost this. And then the risk of controlling somebody, the idea of controlling somebody's entire alignment with just one body part is kind of crazy to me anyway. But the risk of this, that if this goes south, your ability to turn and put me back into this position where it's all of a sudden, this is going to be so much more difficult. If, if I slap you in the face, probably this is going to be something like your default position. If I go slap nine people in the face, all nine of them are going to go like this. Absolutely. And the trouble with this is that all your wrist locks don't work when the guy's tense. All your arm locks don't work when the guy's arms are reasonably in. Exactly. And if we're looking at this where we are having uh, smaller people, whether it's smaller men or women who are typically weaker physically compared to men, especially some of these guys when you're dealing with criminals that don't care about the drugs they're taking. So we're looking at people that are going to be on uh, something like PCP or abusing steroids. We need someone who's smaller to be able to use a technique that works on a larger opponent. So let's get back to the escort position. We're jumping all over the place here. Yeah, I'm fine with the escort position in the sense that some people just need a little nudge going forward. So bouncing, I have taken a ton of people out where they're just like, no, I'm not leaving. And it's just like, hey man, we're going. And as soon as I start doing this, they were passively resisting. They're going to be verbally fighting back with me. But as soon as it starts going to like a hand on the shoulder, it's like, okay, it's over. A lot of people like to talk big, but their bark is worse than their bite. So this is fine. It starts to create this a bit of a dominant angle where I'm starting to move back to this rear 45 degree angle or behind. Being behind our opponent is the best place that we can be to keep ourselves safe, whether we're trying to run from that situation or take them down. So if this starts going sideways, if I'm really... Exactly. I resorted, to, like, I trained stand-up jiu-jitsu. It was German jiu-jitsu based that I did, which is very much just like Japanese jiu-jitsu. It's all very same to me, where I practice these armbar takedowns, these standing wrist locks, the grips against the shirt, 
The problem with it is that it's very difficult for us to do this in an environment that's going to be against live resisting opponents. One, because frankly I don't think it works, and two, some of them, like the straight arm bar takedown, if I take Stefan down full force, if I am able to make this work, which is going to be rare, Stefan's going to face plant so hard on the mat, you're going to jack your shoulder up, I might even break your elbow or your shoulder, and I'm not going to have training partners. So it almost starts to go in this direction of, uh, it's almost too dangerous to train effectively, but at the same Which time... Which makes it less effective. Because we can't replicate the scenario where we have that intensity of a resisting opponent. We have seen Wakigatame type things like this in MMA, but like you said, this end of the lever isn't secured at all. Yeah, so... So the actually, only way to do it is to do it top speed, 100% commitment, exactly. and use the momentum of your body to break your arm. There's no takedown, there's an yeah, standing so arm Yeah, so it's extremely, extremely low probability that's going to happen. And then when we're especially looking at like a use of force continuum model where we're trying to not use excessive force, I have to use a reasonable amount of force to try and get you out of the bar, to control you, to arrest you. And as soon as joints have become broken in some way, or there's splits <laughs> down the person's face. Or that's x-rayable and photographable. It looks bad in court, it looks bad in a police report, and you're going to have to be facing the reality of possibly having to defend yourself in court. That's always a reality. It really sucks. The rules are there for a purpose, so we have to find ways that we can control somebody safely without getting ourselves hurt and trying to minimize the force that we use on our opponent. What about a pain compliance? Because that's the one alternative is kind of a standing arm lock, and the other is a pain compliance hitting this nerve here and... Cranking and, the wrist. Yeah. I'm not a fan of pain compliance. Because frequently the people that I dealt with, one, if we're looking at, at a bar, people are extremely drunk. If they're extremely drunk, they can feel pain, but they're going to be pretty incoherent and they're going to have a hard time piecing together that pain is because they're not listening. And if they start listening and cooperating, the pain, the pain goes away. But at the same time, it's difficult because I can't let up the pain too much because then you're going to have the ability to slip out. So anytime you see cops cranking something and they're like, stop resisting, stop resisting, but they're cranking harder, they're escalating, the offender or the criminal, the person resisting is escalating, and they're just, it, the whole situation aggros. If people are on drugs, you have a guy on crystal meth, and you're trying to crank a wrist lock on them, they're not going to feel anything. One, they're incredibly strong, and they're going to be able to fight. You're not going to be able to bend that wrist. You're not going to be able to bend the wrist, but even when you do, I've seen guys' fingers bent down to like their forearms, where like the wrist is basically gone at that point. And the guy's still fighting from there. And then, especially from protection services at the hospital, when we're dealing with elderly individuals, which, like, when they're starting to deal with dementia, Alzheimer's, they really can't understand why there's pain. And I saw guys using wrist locks to try and control these people in a hospital-like setting, and it just creates this horrible situation. You sometimes have the family members nearby, you have the nurses and the doctors watching. It looks unprofessional, people can hear it through the walls. So anytime we can start to use techniques that get away from trying to use the limbs, these sticks that are sticking off of the rectangle, because everyone's body is basically just a rectangle with a computer on top of four sticks. Trying to use pain compliance for these levers or sticks sticking out of the body, we're gonna be able to control safer and closing that distance. So like as we are talking about with the escort position, the escort is typically here, and then as soon as someone starts resisting, I'm taking you down into your face magically. There's a big distance I gotta cover here. It's very quick for you to turn, and now where before when I went into the escort position, I was able to grab you, and we could passively kind of start moving on. As soon as I've tried to escalate to some higher technique, maybe I've even jacked up your elbow, and you've come back, if I haven't magically gotten knocked out somehow, which I, I've seen, Officers get so hurt online because they're trying to control someone like this, like going to the escort position from here, and I'm taking away all layers of defense and getting hit. If I'm here, as soon as I start to feel this control is disappearing, moving to the back, resorting to Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, grab. That's what I've found is that as I trained this, the German Jiu Jitsu stand up Japanese Jiu Jitsu material, and I trained no gi submission grappling as well for fun. I found that no matter what, how the situations were playing out, I kept on double-legging people, I kept on moving to their back and taking them down from there. And you and wanted to make the traditional stuff work. I, yeah, I got my brown belt in it, I did it for years, and at a certain point I had to go, why is this not working? I'm trying to make this work in these real scenarios, and I've trained it. I was training sometimes 30 to 40 hours a week. But once again, because it's going to be in a situation where, hey, grab my shirt. No, not that hand, the other hand. Okay, distraction strike. Grab, gripping here, moving into the technique, 
Great. And then as soon as somebody actually does this, they're shoving back, they're grabbing you, they're trying to strike you at the same time, and all of a sudden it's not replicable to the level that I was training in the gym. And it becomes super difficult to try and train that in the gym because then you got to start looking at doing like the padding and the full face helmets so you can actually try and strike each other like you see the guys trying to do in Krav Maga. It becomes very hard to replicate. So anytime we can get close to controlling the body itself would be the main point that I want to be taken away from this. Controlling the hips, controlling the legs, or controlling the shoulders and the upper body for rotational control so we can get behind our opponent. So in the circumstance of this, instead of trying to use this escort position against an actively resisting opponent, immediately moving in to something like seatbelt. Obviously I'm six foot five, so I can do this on almost everybody. This allows me to start controlling Stefan. If Stefan tries to hit me at this point, if I have to, I can tuck my eyes down when we start looking at these self-defense situations. But I'm gonna be able to control Stefan. He can't hit me with anything meaningfully. And this is gonna allow me to start looking at ways to sit Stefan down. And this was 90% of how I arrested people when I did loss prevention, catching them stealing, or how I removed people from situations or controlled them until the cops arrived. I sat them down and I could talk to them calmly. If I really needed to, I'd even be able to start tying up an arm here. I could tie up the leg or their arm with my leg to take this out completely. We're trying to stay away from vascular neck restraints or trying to go to an actual rear naked choke unless your life was in danger, but that's a whole other scenario. Control the person, looks great on camera, and it's going to give us the ability to start looking at ways to start bringing the arms behind the back, turning them out. So it's like, Stefan, get your legs out to the side here. I'm going to turn you face down, face down, face down. I want to be able to still control and put Stefan into these positions to be able to actually complete an arrest if I need to, or to sit on a person sometimes for half an hour. Sometimes at the hospital when we're dealing with someone on PCP, all we could do was dogpile and try and control this person until we had backup arrive. There wasn't a chance, or especially if there's a weapon involved. At that case, it's like you're just trying to isolate the arm with that knife and everyone's just laying on that shoulder and the rest of the body to try and just make sure that sucker can't move. If you can pull the weapon away, great, but if not, stay there until you have more backup arriving. That's mm -hmm. Hopefully you have that opportunity depending on the job you have, if it's corrections or law enforcement or bouncing. And if you're doing this job by yourself, that's going to be a judgment call on whether you're going to continue controlling because you have to, or if you can disengage and run from that situation. Control. Move in close. Any of the stuff standing up top, instead of grabbing at the wrists here and trying to get these fancy wrist locks, as soon as I grab Stefan and he starts pulling those arms away, I'm moving in to just like body clinches. From here, if Stefan tries hitting me, it's gonna be light. Like you're gonna eat punches when you start to get into these violent altercations. So it's about minimizing damage. I'm either all out, so you can't touch me, or I make sure I'm all in. This is why grappling is so effective. And then from here, I look at controlling, whether I'm taking them down this way or I'm looking at ways to find this. Even here, control and rotation, it's the hips this time. So this is what a shorter person would do against a taller person. I keep my head hidden, so if Stefan's trying to throw elbows back at me, he can't. And then from here, I'm able to start looking into ways to take Stefan down and control him through dominant position. Grappling needs to be taught to law enforcement and security before these traditional Maybe. techniques that we see in Aikido and Japanese Jiu Jitsu where it looks great on paper but unfortunately this stuff because of the ignorance of some people because they haven't got to use this stuff in the real self-defense situations or these situations where you actually have to try and restrain somebody or because they're huge and they made it work themselves and they think that this is just going to be a blanket technique that can work for even someone who's five foot tall and giving up a hundred pounds to somebody it's now become stuff that is actually taught formally within a law enforcement use of force model. And I think that's highly unfortunate. Well, it's also very seductive from a training point of view, because if I want to train 20 cops in simulated strike and move into a wrist lock, the odds of somebody getting injured during the training itself are fairly low. Yeah. But if you're training something realistically against exactly. resistance, yep. as every jiu-jitsu guy knows. Yeah, we get injured, injured in jiu-jitsu. It's yeah. inevitable. So, you know, if, if the chief sitting there at the desk, well, chief, we've got two options here. We've got this jiu-jitsu stuff. There are going to be some injuries, though. Mm -hmm. And we've got this other stuff that claims to be, you know, magically based on 10,000 years of Japanese tradition where you magically immobilize somebody. And guess what? None of your officers are ever going to get hurt during this training. Many of them are going to choose 
the second category. Also, it's unfortunate Magic that we plus have to, no injuries. Yeah, we have Magic to, plus less overtime. It's unfortunately, it's unfortunate that we have to take into account those things like liability and stuff because we know that that's going to cost money. It's going to set us up to potentially get sued and stuff like that. So companies are like, we want to give you training, but we're going to do it in a way that's, like you said, unrealistic. But we can say we did it for the sake of doing it. So we've covered our asses. Yeah. We've given. Rory him got the stabbed, skills. but he got he got all the training that yeah. he was supposed to get. He's yeah, one week of use of force training, and I don't have to have another refresher for like three years. Mm-hmm. A lot of us know that doing Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, it's like if you take even a week off training, sometimes you're gonna feel you a little bit sluggish in a few areas, let alone years. And so, unfortunately, we can't rely on the the organizations that we work for to give us that proper training. So hopefully, you guys can understand where we're, where at least I'm coming from when I'm talking about this. I do have some real life experience in the workforce restraining people. Unfortunately, too much experience, way too much violence. But look at training Brazilian Jiu Jitsu or wrestling or Judo or, I mean, it, my boxing and Muay Thai training from years ago has also paid huge dividends just because of the fact that it's a live sparring element. It, don't get into a, a punching match with somebody because if you put your hands up and you start throwing fists with somebody, whether you're security, loss prevention, uh, you a police win, officer, but you're gonna lose. that and also on camera, yeah. it looks awful. You're Everything gonna, gets filmed yeah. on, on You're going to lose. Phone. You're going to lose, exactly. And so, but that's the big problem that jujitsu guys have is that we get to learn how to grapple, but as soon as striking starts getting thrown at us, mm-hmm. oh, all plans go out the window. Like, I think it was Mike Tyson that said everyone has a plan until they get punched. So being able to slip punches and feel comfortable in that range and even throwing jabs where I'm not going to throw jabs with like a, a close fist and use my knuckles that splits the guy open and then once again you look bad in court as well as I'm risking the spreading of blood which then blood uh, diseases blood could be, pathogens. yeah blood more pathogens could be passed over to me. Being able to open palm strike with a jab even if it's just to the chest. I'm trying to find a way to range modify boxing tool. as a range management tool so that then I can close that distance to grappling. So the main thing, jiu-jitsu obviously I think is the best when it comes to, Brazilian jiu-jitsu is the best when it comes to this kind of stuff because we have such a wide range of being able to control somebody with just position and dominance all the way to being able to break bones and kill somebody if we unfortunately needed to. But any kind of martial art or a combative sport that has a live sparring element is going to make... It's so much more realistic and so much more effective when you actually have to apply this in a real world situation. So that's like the main thing for me that if you're thinking, how do I come up with a, a, a martial art or a combative sport that I should be training? Because the Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, not everybody wants to do it, but if you're in law enforcement, well, you might be in the wrong line of work because you're gonna have to deal with that. Find that live sparring element and you're gonna have so much more success with whatever you're training.